Was, these are people who are with USA Today and who've been on the bus capade all around the country. Ken Pulse is my chief of staff. Yeah. He's from Illinois and has worked on our newspapers. Elmhurst. I know it well. Played against Elmhurst College several times in football. Did, did you win? Huh? Did you win? Uh, yes, except for one game. And that was the game that took place, the first game they had to postpone a couple. The first one they had then resumed playing after the death of their captain. And uh, it was very apparent that they had dedicated the game to that dead <laughs> captain. And emotion has a great deal to do in foot with football. Sure. He was a great track star. He went to the University of Missouri. Dan Graney is uh, from Boston. He's a graduate of Harvard. He's the no. intellectual in our group. The rest of us are farm <laughs> boys. And he, he was the editor of the Harvard Lampoon, and he did to yeah. us what the cartoonists and editors do to you all the time. So we hired him to get him off our back. Oh, well. The joke's on me. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, the Lampoon gets at me now and then. I know. <laughs> Kathleen Smith Berry with the camera is from Nashville, Tennessee. That's uh, the state that produced Howard Baker, among other folks, as you know. She's with our Nashville, Tennessean. And Paula Burton is with our TV station in Atlanta. She's a Georgian. Joanna Newman, uh, you've probably seen yes. more of than you care to. She's <laughs> with the White House Press Corps for us. So okay. those are the players. All right. We, uh, we've been visiting with uh, people around the country, all 50 governors, about 3,000 folks. We're not investigating anybody. There's not a Sam Donaldson in this crowd. We're just all friendly people. And we've been trying to present an understanding through USA Today uh, to folks around the country of each of the states and its leaders and the people in it. So we're delighted to be able to end up here with you. Well, your paper comes in every morning uh, with our breakfast tray upstairs. Good, I hope you look at it occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. We uh, uh, visited with all the governors, including your successor in California, and uh, got came away with the impression that uh, all those jobs are pretty tough jobs. You've had them both. You've been the governor of yes. California, you're the president. Which is the tougher of the two jobs and which one is the most fun? Well, I found a certain excitement and pleasure in, in both of them, but I, I do believe, having been in both, that that is the best training school for this job. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, earlier in our time, that was normally the source of presidents was right. It is the nearest thing uh, to this job. The only addition that you have here is the uh, national security uh, right. part of the job, which is supposed to be the most important according to the Constitution. But uh, they are executives in the same sense, chief executives in their states, and we have to remember that uh, our government was created to be a federation of sovereign states. And is that a better training job then than being in the U.S. Senate or Congress? Yes, with all due respect to the senators. <laughs> I think that a legislative position there in the manner in which worked by committees and so forth is far different than that job in which there finally and so often comes that moment in which uh, <laughs> the problem is in front of you and on your desk and uh, uh, you're responsible. We also visited an ex-governor who wanted to be president out in Topeka, Kansas, before you went out. We went to see Alf Landon about oh, a month ago. Yes. And he was getting ready for your visit. Yeah. After being out there and visiting with him uh, and thinking about it, uh, do you want to live to be 100, and do you think you will? Well, considering the alternative, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in no hurry to go. Uh, yes, I, uh, I was quite impressed. Now, I didn't remind him of the fact that uh, when he ran for president, I was on the other side. Right. I was a Democrat. And All the press pointed that out. Oh, they did. <laughs> but um, I, was, I was amazed uh, uh, how sharp he is, okay. how up on everything. Physically, he has a little problem walking and has right. to uh, have assistance. But he also bore out something that I have believed in throughout much of my life, and that is uh, the the old cavalry slogan that nothing is so good for the inside of a man as the outside of a horse because up until past 90 he was still riding every day. His horse red. Yep. You talk about red. Yeah, he's now turned red out to pasture yeah. with some farmer friend, yeah. but uh, that was his 
his sport or his athletic endeavor. And uh, I think uh, I'm going to keep on riding. Good. Mr. President, this trip across the country has been an eye opener for a number of us who've never seen the entire nation. And we were struck by the diversity. Yet, we also saw some common bonds. And I'm curious, what do you believe holds this country together to make it truly one nation? Well, I think, it, well, let me, if, if I can, explain that then with something that is not original with me. It's a concept that was written to me once in a letter. You can go to another country and to live. You can go to France and live, but you can't become a Frenchman. You can go to Japan, you can't become Japanese. Whatever country, Greece, Turkey, Germany, any, anything else. But people from every corner of the world can come to America and become an American. And I think that is one of the great things that we're representative of all, and what is the only thing we have in common? And that is that someplace back in the ancestry of each one of us were people who had the courage and the love of freedom to uproot themselves from company and, or from country and, and friends and come here not even knowing the language to begin with, to become a part of this because they saw here something that met that inner demand. Uh, Mr. President, uh, in our tours we interviewed all 50 governors and each one of them is a very aggressive salesman for their state. Uh, they're competing with each other for things like uh, super collider and also for European business. Is this competitiveness an outgrowth of your new federalism and do you think it is more harmful than... Well, better? I think it was built in. Uh, in our Constitution, as a matter of fact, part of the Constitution or the bringing about of the Constitution, a large part, was due to the fact that the 13 colonies, which then became the states of the new republic, uh, had a, a relationship that was uh, very often terribly hostile and even threats of, of uh, leaving the Union and there were even talk of creating several countries instead of one. And then they met in the Constitution and they brought about this relationship. Yes, it is a natural competition, but it is a fair competition. Yes, states uh, want to bring industries to their states and so forth, and yet it's all done in, a, in this unity of, of one nation, and there is never any thought of any of them. Of, they've willingly given a certain authority to the federal government, which over the recent years the federal government has tried to expand. I remember back when Franklin Delano Roosevelt ran his first term in 1932. Uh, he didn't sound like Democrats sound today. Uh, he ran on the basis that the federal government should return to states and local authorities the autonomy and authority that had been unjustly seized by the federal government. Because the whole principle of this country was to leave as much as possible of authority at the levels of government nearest to the people, closest to them. And so I think that's just a, a good sign of energy and so forth for states to uh, not huddle together and send everyone, but, it, but to be out there and competing, but competing within the, the laws that have been laid down. Mr. President? You were born and raised in small towns in Illinois, and many of your predecessors, like Jimmy Carter, was raised in the Plains. Is there something in small town values that makes for a better president? I don't know whether it makes for a better president, but I have to tell you that one of my regrets with my own children was that they had to be raised in a city. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't mean to hurt the feelings of the people who live in our great cities, but there is something about a small town that, uh, well, the very fact that you know everybody by name, literally, and certainly, and if it's a little, getting up a little more uh, to a uh, somewhat larger level, uh, as I had that experience, I was born in a town of 850 people, but then we moved to uh, Dixon, where I really did my growing up and going through school and high school and so forth, and that was about 10,000. But uh, I have a little story that I think illustrates the kind of 
thing that exists in a small town. As a boy, I had a dog that was the love of my life. He was named Bobby Jiggs. And uh, Bobby Jiggs ran away. He was lost. And I was broken hearted. And then I looked out a window. And here came a squad car down the middle of the street. And leaning out the window was the driver the, or the policeman that wasn't driving. And in front of them, coming down the middle of the street, was Bobby Jiggs. And he was every time Bobby Jiggs tried to sashay or something. No, sir, they were behind him, and the policeman was yelling and even knew his name. And they ran him right into our yard. They'd found him clear over on the other side of town, and, and they knew where he belonged. Now, that wasn't just us. We were, we were small fry. That had to be, you had to say, my golly, they probably know everybody's dog in town. Yeah. Is that right. Nixon? Yes. Is that Nixon? Yeah. But, Mr. President, I was wondering recently whether your recent hostage crisis has given you a more sympathetic view of Jimmy Carter in his. Has it changed your view of the what it must have? The situation? Oh, well, I've, uh, uh, yes, there were two things about, about that. One is, uh, uh, I did not go around saying things he should do because I have always felt that in this job, the person in this job uh, has access to all the information that no one else has. Um, I think all of us got a little impatient at times about this because here we knew where the hostages were and it was a government that was responsible for keeping them. But I have always felt that whenever the constitutional rights to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness of any American are being unjustly denied, whether here within our own country or elsewhere. It is the responsibility of 250 million Americans in this country to see that that is rectified and those rights are restored. Mr. President, can we turn to your activity later today and your mention of the 250 million Americans? You're going to greet the Pope. Yes. Here's a man who's elected for life, and he leads 630 million people, or Catholics as their leader around the world. A year elected for a maximum of eight years, you lead 250 million people. Which is the better job? Which would you rather be, President <laughs> or Pope? <laughs> I couldn't be Pope because I'm a Protestant. <laughs> that got me out of that one, didn't it? <laughs> Which is the better job then? If, if a person had a choice of being president or Pope, uh, which do you think has the most attraction? Well, I, it's hard for me to conceive of someone ever being in that position <laughs> of having such a choice. But I would have to say that his calling uh, is certainly to a higher level than, uh, than even this one is. And uh, uh, although I call upon his superior, I think maybe as often as he does, for help, as you know, Lincoln, I, th I don't know of any president who has ever failed to do that. Lincoln said that it, he had been driven to his knees many times because there was no place else to go. And he also said, that he couldn't meet the responsibilities of this position for 15 minutes if he did not feel that he could call upon someone who was stronger and wiser than all others. So I think the Pope's calling is, as I say, to completely different to... There are some cardinals in this country who have been mentioned or have indicated an aspiration to becoming a Pope, though. If an American had a choice, were in that position of, of setting his sights on being the Pope or the President, uh, which, would you, which do you think they should opt for? Well, I think that the, as I say, someone who feels a calling to, uh, to a position of that kind, uh, I think that takes, takes precedence. And of course, it, it could be uh, now that this Pope has broken the age-old tradition of all Popes being Italian, mm -hmm. that, um, that I'm sure that uh, the papacy is, uh, is open to uh, uh, Catholic clergy all over the world. I never thought of it, though, as 
being something that someone went out and sought like you <laughs> seek the presidency. And as a matter of fact, I've always thought about this job, that you don't decide uh, you should try for this job. The people let you know whether you should try for it or not. Mr. President, uh, Vice President Bush has portrayed himself as the candidate with experience. Can you give us an example or two of, of where Vice President Bush has been the pivotal player in a policy decision? Well, I can't answer it in that context, but let me just say, uh, I don't know that there has ever been a vice president who has been more completely involved in all that goes on than this vice president. When I was governor, I made up my mind that the lieutenant governor should be like the executive vice president in a corporation. He should not be uh, just sitting over on the sideline and, uh, waiting for <laughs> something to happen to the governor. And I did this with the lieutenant governor in, uh, in California. And I had the same resolution when I came here that the president, or the vice president, this is, uh, you don't leave uh, that kind of ability uh, out in another room while you're discussing all the things that go on and the decisions to be made. And so he hasn't just been feeling my pulse and uh, <laughs> <laughs> sitting by. Uh, he has been actively engaged. He's, uh, he's been all over the world in our behalf as an emissary um, and, uh, and not just to funerals <laughs> with act, act, actual missions. Mr. President, uh, since your recent operations, I uh, sometimes feel I know more about your body than I do about my own. Uh, yes, you, sometimes the sketches on the air bothered me. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, how, did, how do you feel about that? I would be a little bit perturbed. Well, I recognize that you give up a certain amount of privacy when you, when you take this job, but I must say, um, I did get a little weary of uh, reading all the diagnoses and the prognoses that were being made to, during my time, and uh, particularly more recently when I found that I was supposed to be shuffling and um, hesitant and uh, 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 aged beyond my years, I, uh, uh, that, was, that was a little bothersome. But embarrassing too? Uh, uh, well, never mind. Well, I, I'm glad I, they don't do it to me. I, no. <laughs> I tried not to be. My, uh, the biggest wound that I have suffered in all of that, though, just simply has to do with the most recent incident. I, uh, all my life, well, almost, clear back into teenage, for seven years, beginning in my teens, I was a lifeguard. And uh, most of my life, I have never been without the marks of a bathing suit uh, because uh, of tanning. And uh, during my motion picture days, it gave me extra sleep because I was one of the few that didn't have to wear makeup. I had a year-round tan, <laughs> and now, as a result of this, uh, I can't do that anymore. And I'm, I'm a missionary for telling you all, don't lie on the beach and get tanned. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. President, you've indicated that after you leave office, you'll campaign for various candidates and causes. Yeah. Could you tell us what some of those might include? Well, you know, you're sort of titular head of the party in this job, so you have to be during the primaries and until the uh, nominations are made, you, you, uh, you can't show any preference for anyone. But I do believe in uh, that there is a difference in the leadership of the two parties and what they stand for. And having been in the other party also, uh, I have to believe that the Republican Party today is more like the Democratic Party of uh, when I was uh, a lad. Uh, and they, they seem to kind of reverse their positions. The Republican Party was the party of high tariffs and the party of uh, protectionism and so forth, and that's all been reversed, other things too. But uh, I, yes, I believe that as long as I can, uh, it's an obligation to do what you, what you can to uh, uh, use the experience to go before the people. As a matter of fact, you referred to one thing a little while ago that I would not do at all while I'm in this job, but that I would like to do once I'm not in the job. Mm -hmm. 
and that is remove the amendment to the Constitution that limits the president to two terms. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't do that for behalf of who might be president, but I think it's an invasion of the democratic rights of the people to tell the people that they can't vote for whoever they want to vote for and for as long as they do. When you stop to think that a Congress that has people that have been in there for 30 or 40 years in their jobs telling the American people, no, they can't have a president they might want for more than two. And it was born out of a kind of get even with uh, FDR uh, for his seeking four terms. But I, uh, I'd like to see that changed. Mr. President, you've been <coughs> generous with your time and candid with your comments, and we appreciate it. I want to tell you that with the bus capade behind us, next year we're going on a jet capade. We're going to do the seven continents, about 30 countries. And maybe if you're willing, we'll come back and talk with you at the end of that one. I'd like that. And we'll probably be asking yeah. powerful people like Howard and your State Department and Defense Department to help us <coughs> open some doors over there. Having been a number of them now myself, quite a number, more than I ever thought I would see when I was growing up, uh, I can make a prediction. You will come home hard and fast, Americans. We expect that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. you have we want to leave a little memento with you. It's inexpensive. Oh. Well. So you don't have to declare it, but I hope maybe it'll hold some papers down on your desk and have you think about USA Today. Kate. Well, thank you very much. Thank I'm you. Pleased sir. to have that. Good luck. Right. Thank you. I didn't get a chance to ask you if you think Gorbachev is coming. Do you really think he'll be here for next year? I am afraid to say that because so often they take that as a sign of too much eagerness. Because you know, I think there was one really stage about the year 86, and I had pledged that I would be there in 87. I made that agreement, but uh, I'm hopeful. It's very hopeful. I think he's got some, some really real problems, and with his own country. Also, people who object to the glass Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much, President. I'd like to say uh, hi on behalf of uh, our driver, Joel Driver, and Dave Still, a couple guys. We're five minutes late for the speech. Oh, for goodness sakes, I've got to go see the constitutional essay winners. Very nice to meet you. You're terrific. Well, thank you.